Let's talk about pizza. For many people with T1D, pizza is notorious for making glucose go crazy, whether that's lows halfway through the third slice, or spectacular highs at 2 a.m., or both. Sometimes it can feel like you have to choose between enjoying pizza and keeping glucose in target range. But you don't actually have to choose, because in this video we'll talk about why pizza and many other high-fat foods are so challenging, and what we can do to manage them. Hi everyone, welcome to Type 1 Diabetes World, where we give you the practical strategies to successfully manage T1D. All right, what can we expect to happen to glucose when pizza is on the menu? If we follow the standard plan for calculating and timing an insulin dose, it might look something like this. You're having a pretty good day and you're thinking, hey, I know what I'm doing with my diabetes management. The pizza arrives and you make an educated guess of about, let's say 30 grams of carb for each slice. Then you give your dose of rapid acting insulin maybe even a few minutes ahead of time, like your diabetes provider is always telling you to do. For about an hour, you're thinking, wow, that worked out great. Then things start to get messy. Glucose is dropping below target, and you're thinking, how is that possible? There are 60 grams of carbohydrate on board. You go ahead and treat the low, and things improve. Then, at about the two to three hour mark, glucose starts to rise, and then just keeps going until the middle of the night when you, or you and your child, wake up feeling cruddy and give a correction dose. This is a phenomenon that happens a lot, even in the era of technology like pumps and CGM. You'll also see similar patterns with any foods that are both high in refined carbs and high in fat. So things like a burger and fries, a restaurant meal with lots of butter and hidden sugar, a croissant, or ice cream. Okay, so why exactly is this so tricky? To answer that question, we first need to understand a little bit about the different nutrients in our food and how each one affects glucose. The big three are carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Carbohydrate has the fastest and most direct effect on glucose, which is why our most common insulin regimens for T1D are based around dosing for carbs, using an insulin to carbohydrate ratio. Protein also has an effect on glucose, and that tends to show up about two to three hours after eating. How much it affects glucose depends on how much is eaten and whether it's consumed by itself or mixed with carbohydrate or fat. Fat is not directly converted to glucose, but as it's broken down, it creates insulin resistance, making insulin work less effectively, and that results more indirectly in higher glucoses. This usually happens about six to 10 hours after eating. If you're keeping an eye on nutrition labels, foods with more than about 15 to 20 grams of fat are the ones that tend to make a difference. If a food leaves a grease stain on a napkin, that's a pretty good indicator it's in that zone too. Both protein and fat will also affect glucose by slowing down the absorption of carbohydrates and delaying that typical rise in glucose. The upshot here is that foods with a mix of these three nutrients can surprise us, even when we've read the label and we think we dialed in the carb count. All right, back to our pizza. So let's look at our glucose tracing again. Protein and fat are slowing down the carb absorption for crust and tomato sauce, leading to this dip. Then we get an extra uptick from treating the low with carbs. Next, we see the long, slow rise as the rapid acting insulin wears off and the rest of the pizza carbs are absorbed. After that, we add in the effect of the fat breakdown after about six hours and on into the night. So what can we do here to better manage glucoses in the midst of all this? Let's talk about four strategies. Number one, do your best on the carb count. If you don't have a nutrition label because you're out and about, you can make an educated guess. Carb counts for pizza tend to run anywhere from about 20 to 60 grams, and a lot of that has to do not only with the size of the slice, but the thickness of the crust and how much sugar is added to the tomato sauce. Many of the major restaurant chains publish their carb counts for pizza on their websites or on carb counting apps, so that can help you get into the ballpark. If you know how to use a digital food scale, this is also very helpful. Number two. Insulin timing is everything. This is one of those times you're off the hook for giving that pre-bolus or that head start for your carb dosing. The exception is if you are correcting a high glucose before the meal. As we've said, fat and protein slow down the absorption of carbohydrate. So what we want to try to do is match the carb absorption better by giving less insulin up front and spreading the rest over a period of several hours. Check with your diabetes team before making any changes in your insulin regimen, but here's some common advice. For those on injections, you can try splitting the dose to give 50% before and 50% in a second injection about two hours later. 50-50 is usually a good starting point for trial and error, though some people find one third upfront and two third later on works better. The more cheese or meat-based toppings, the longer it will take for the carbs to absorb, 
So that can also help you with your calculations. For those on pumps, you can use an extended or combination bolus to give some insulin up front and spread the rest of the dose out over about two to three hours. Again, 50-50 is a good starting point. If you're not already aware of how to use these advanced bolus features on your pump, this is a great time to talk to your diabetes team for help with that. If you use a hybrid closed loop pump system with some automated insulin delivery, the system may be able to help compensate a bit for any dip or delayed rise in glucose, but it may also need some manual intervention from the user, similar to the process for standard pump regimens. Number three, more insulin is probably necessary. As we've said, it's not only the carbs that can raise glucose. The fat and any protein toppings will likely require a higher dose of insulin overall. You can think of this as those more or less needing their own dose, but not until later. Talk to your own diabetes team about details, but pump users may find it helpful to set an increased temporary basal rate for about six to eight hours to cover that delayed rise. And those on injections might try an additional preemptive injection a few hours later. Number four, embrace the trial and error and have a little patience. The goal here is to be able to eat these challenging foods from time to time and still have glucose in range. And that freedom with food choices is really important to living well with T1D. Try not to just throw up your hands and say, this is impossible. I just can't ever eat this stuff, even on my birthday. And on the flip side, don't feel like you have to settle for having out of target numbers every time if these foods are ones you or your child wants to enjoy regularly. If you keep after it with just a bit more attention to what's working and not working, you're going to get there. Okay, let's recap. What makes pizza tricky is the combination of the three major nutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, and the fact that our typical insulin dosing strategies really only address the carbohydrate. Carbohydrate absorbs quickly and has the biggest effect on glucose. Protein has a smaller, slower effect over several hours. Fat breakdown also contributes to higher glucose, often about six to 10 hours after eating. Some strategies for dosing include splitting the insulin dose so not all of it is given at the time of the meal and increasing overall insulin to compensate for the delayed effect of fat. Trial and error is part of the process and you can definitely work this out with a little effort and a little patience. That's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. If you found it helpful, please be sure to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.